Sadie, thanks again for being here. Uh, I'm really happy that um, you're going to tell us more about about your work. And um, you know, I feel like it's been quite a while since we first met. You were an MFA student at UCSD, uh, a campus which is near and dear to my heart. My father was a physics professor there. And growing up, I spent a lot of time running around that campus playing. And so when I met you there and when we saw, I saw your work for the first time and we started a dialogue, it came from a very um, personal place, which is also a theme in your work, which also has always attracted me to your work, um, is that sort of starting point from the personal and the familial. Um, I guess we continue the dialogue when you were an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And I'm really glad that we continue to talk about uh, your work to this day. Um, you know, one thing that I always tell people when they ask me about your work, what I love about your, your sculptures, whether it's your drawings, your sculptures, the collages, um, is the way you explore issues of uh, sort of race and power in American history, but always through the lens of your own experience. Um, and that's something that Anthony Graham, uh, the curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, has talked about. Uh, he, he was the curator for your exhibition, Dear 1968, um, at the museum. And he wrote a very thoughtful essay about your work for the Young, Gifted, and Black Traveling Exhibition. Uh, for, the, for the book, which will accompany the Young, Gifted, Black, Black Tra Traveling Exhibition. And I just wanted to you know, read a little bit quickly from, from that essay, what he said about you. I'm sure you're well aware of this, but um, he says, for Sadie Barnett, the personal is not only political, it's historical. Through sculpture, drawing, and collage, she explores the social and political influences on her life and the lives of her extended family. Looking to the stories and experiences of her parents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, Barnett makes space for these intimate narratives, showing how they are integral to a larger understanding of US history. Barnett calls diverse archives of material, from family letters to bureaucratic paperwork, and asserts her own perspective within these narratives. Through her appropriation of these documents, Barnett ties together the varied threads of family history, politics, and institutional power. So, you know, as I said, it's also, you know, for me, it's this interplay of, of public and private, of personal, of the, of the personal and the political, which fascinates, which fascinates me about your work and why I've so enjoyed living with it in my collection. When it came down to the curators of the Young Gifted Black, Black exhibi exhibition, um, choosing something from our collection to include in the show, they had a lot of choice. They had drawings, they had canned sculptures, um, they had collages, and they chose Untitled People's World, uh, a work which, in which you incorporate pages from the file that the FBI kept on your father, who was a Black Panther and a civil rights activist in Oakland during the 1970s. Um, so I was really thrilled when they chose that work. It's one of the favorite works of yours that are in the collection, and I think it also fits in really well with the exhibition. So I'm happy that you're gonna tell us a little bit more about that work, that work from the standpoint of your own work as a whole and how it, you know, just tell us more about that work. Um, and, um, and I'll just let you take, that, take it from here in that way. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's indeed true that we've had a ongoing dialogue for a long, for a long time and it's, I think, um, great to sort of see you know, what threads remain and what things change and, you know, to really um, reflect on the community of artists, collectors, curators, supporters that, um, you know, are really engaged in a long-term conversation. Um, so that's always felt really special to me, you know, especially since my time at Studio Museum. Um, and to speak, you know, specifically about this work that comes out of this ongoing, um, engagement and really reclamation of this FBI file amassed on my father during his time um, with the Panthers actually down in LA. So he founded the Compton chapter of the, Pan of the Panthers down there in 1968, um, as well as he surveilled with um, his time up in Northern California working with Angela Davis um, to work on her freedom campaign. Um, and you know what really struck me when I was going through the files was um, 
how some things that you know might seem really mundane are actually you know quite powerful, chilling, um, terrifying, illuminating when they're being recorded through you know this very oppressive state surveillance apparatus. Um, and I think sometimes you know the word surveillance can sound a bit passive, like oh it's just you know recording the goings on, but in reality, you know in this file it, there's evidence of harassment, intimidation, um, fomenting of personal relationships. My dad was fired from his job at the post office because of his involvement with the Panthers. Um, so it's really, it's really um, you know, a life being undone at the granular level. Um, and particularly with, with this work, um, untitled People's World, you know, the parentheticals refers to the people's world which was a like lefty newspaper that my dad was uh, a subscriber of and in fact that's uh, oftentimes how the government knew his address was by monitoring the subscriptions to the people's world so there's a moment where he moves to a new apartment and they're not privy to it but can follow him through his subscription to this um, publication so to me that really shows you know, the power of media, um, the intensity of the surveillance, um, where like, you know, literature and um, journalism and who's participating in this conversation is being surveilled. Um, and then there's also these kind of small moments of, you know, talking about um, he's in school, he's, you know, attending college and just being reminded how young my father is. And, um, you know, these things that really make up a life I think when you're talking about the elements of the personal as political and the personal as historical, to me sometimes, you know, especially with the Panthers, we look back and it kind of gets this, you know, macho bravado that it was all about being in the streets and all about, you know, carrying guns and the leather jackets, um, the photo ops, but so much of the work they were doing was about family. If you think about the free breakfast program, you know, it's literally feeding children. Um, they had a free ambulance program. They were involved in preventing evictions from being carried out on you know, fellow citizens. So to me, there's really a, a way to look at it that's very much about caretaking for you know, our black families um, in a way that they weren't being taken care of in this country. So to me, that's really where you know, the family element comes in and thinking about you know, the living room as a place where so much of this politics is really um, taking place. So there's other moments in the uh, FBI surveillance file where they talk about my Auntie Birdie and you know, they're watching her because she opened her garage for the Panther meetings. So it's really these acts of, you know, um, hospitality and caretaking that are, are instantly political, especially, um, you know, when it's happening in a Black family. That's great. I'm just thinking um, sort of the, you sort of uh, laid out the sort of conceptual, historical, autobiographical sort of um, origin of the work. You know, it's also, which is very fascinating, and obviously the work is a diptych, and there's two pages, you know, from that file, which is very long, longer and and as you're talk, as you're saying, you know, has a lot of, um, you know, has provided a source resource for you. Um, the work is also, you know, aside from being a historical political document, it's also, you know, aesthetically very interesting. And I was curious if you would just say a little bit about sort of, and maybe with reference to your other work, your other collages, the way you use sort of the, um, you know, the sort of magenta. Um, coloring on it and the sort of, you know, the sort of graphic editing or graphic flourishes that you've added to those two pages so that they become much more than just historical documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, um, definitely an important, you know, element and the way that I approach everything is through this, you know, art making lens. Um, and to me, it was a real balance between reclaiming the file, you know, somehow putting my mark on the file, um, somehow taking something that was meant to, you know, unravel my father's life, if not, you know, end his life as so many folks, um, you know, weren't as lucky to live through um, 
being under COINTELPRO, you know, surveillance. Um, but he did live through this and, you know, he's alive today and able to see this work um, be flipped around, subverted and turned into something that can celebrate him. Um, so I wanted to convey that while at the same time, um, let the, the files speak for themselves in a way. Um, I tend to often have a, you know, somewhat minimalist approach. Um, I always want there to be sort of evidence of the hand, but it's a little bit shrouded. Um, there's a few degrees of separation, almost as an act of protection in a way. So to me, spray paint was a perfect vessel to have my hand there, but it's also being, you know, translated through um, the like cap of the spray paint can. So it's not quite as gestural or emotive as maybe a, a marker or a paintbrush splash. Um, it's also a material that embodies, you know, maybe my generation as like an 80s baby in conversation with this more, you know, 60s teletype aesthetic. Um, I also wanted to add something like my own layer of redaction or notation and maybe think about, you know, a language that would be unknowable and unsurveillable, um, you know, my own secret protective language maybe. And I think, you know, finally, with regards to the color, um, if anyone's familiar with, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, who was the, you know, architect and puppet master of COINTELPRO, um, I just honestly thought that pink and glitter would be the thing that would infuriate him the most and would be like the most, um, you know, debasement of this officious black and white, um, you know, authoritative, truthiness document would be to splash it with pink. Um, and so that's really where, you know, where that started from, as well as thinking about, you know, pink as something that I find very powerful. Um, and especially when thinking about J. Edgar Hoover, it almost became like weaponized. That's great. I didn't, um, the connection with the pink uh, the color pink, I had not heard that explanation before. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess just, uh, and the glitter, you also referenced glitter, of course. Do you, you know, pink is something in, in your background. I can see on the work, some of the works on your wall and in your other work. Um, is that the, the color pink, the use of spray paint, the use of glitter as a collage element, um, in terms of your other, the, your large work as a whole or other, other works or other series, do, does that meaning, do those meanings, um, are those the same meanings or purposes or sort of, um, I guess, uh, do you want the viewer to take away the same, like are they serving the same purpose as they are in this work, this diptych, Untitled People's World, or do those elements, the color pink, spray paint, um, you know, glitter, are they used to different purposes in, in other works of yours, just speaking a little more generally about, about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the uh, the pink, the glitter, the like hologram surface textures definitely can, you know, work for different um, purposes at different times. Um, I think there's, you know, something about glitter that is just very uh, transportive. Sometimes I think of it as like you know, um, the next available plane maybe, or a space, um, a potential space of like liberated ecstasy transcendence, um, you know, not exactly having vocabulary available to us in this moment to describe, you know, how radically different the future is that I'm dreaming about um, and hoping for and studying for, um, working towards but using these glitter fields as really placeholders for that imagined, you know, potentiality. Um, I think other times, you know, the glitter works to kind of seduce um, and fascinate the viewer, kind of lure you in. And then once you're there, you're maybe contemplating, um, you know, more cerebral or political um, aspects of the work. Um, I think, you know, both with pink and glitter, it's one of those things that kind of can't be ignored. Either you love it or you hate it, but it, it catches you. And, you know, just for something that's a color to be um, sort of noisy 
and demand space, especially something that's kind of relegated to, you know, like little um, toys or tchotchkes um, or thought of as like, you know, this very feminine color for it to be able to be um, bold and powerful and speak volumes, I really appreciate. And of course, I always hope that, you know, it doesn't fall into this binary conversation um, of like pink equals women. I always hate when that connection is made, but I think of it more as like a um, pink denoting this like femme play that is available to a broad range of genders and employed by a broad range of genders um, in a way that's really about like this kind of conversation with other, you know, um, femme styling um, individuals who just really appreciate adornment and over the top presentation of, you know, manicures and um, decorative elements and jewelry and this kind of language that you're um, speaking with each other about kind of the most over the top fabulousness. And I hope that that can, you know, continue to be celebrated as we complicate what gender means today. Mm -hmm.